Well, today is Pentecost Sunday. It marks this moment when we're leaving the 40 days of Easter and entering the season of Pentecost. I think I'm right that Pentecost is one of the oldest festivals. It's actually a festival in the life of the church, and it is an important one. I've been struck over the last couple of days. I don't know how many of you listen to classical music radio stations. There's a good one on FM and there's, one, there's a good one on satellite. And they've been playing, there's lots of wonderful, wonderful Pentecostal music that they've been playing on the classical stations. I've really been struck by that. So it's an important moment when we celebrate the birth uh, of the church is um, the way in which it is oftentimes described. That, is, that may be a bit inadequate. I'll say a word about that in a moment. But we find the story of Pentecost in the first 47 verses of the second chapter of Acts. When you look at your bulletin, it says Acts 2, 1 through 11. And the reason is that my assistant Charlotte said, Don, what's the text for Sunday? And I just went by memory. I said 2, 1 through 11. And as is often the case, I was wrong again. So there's my mea culpa. It's a long story, so I'm not going to read all of it for you. We're going to read the first few verses, and then we're going to skip down and read the final verses. So we'll look at it here on the screen. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. These were the disciples in the temple in Jerusalem 40 days after the ascension of Jesus. We'll talk about that in a moment. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where, where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of a fire appeared among them. If you're watching this screen, you'll go from that screen and you can see the tongues of fire in the window. And a tongue rested upon each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. So they came different nationalities, different languages. And at this sound, the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in their native language. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we uh, hear each of us in our own native language? And the following verses are verses where uh, the writer of Acts, Luke, just lists out the names of different nationalities. And a lot of them are names that I can't pronounce. So it's a good section for me to skip. So we get down to verse 41. So those who were welcomed, so those who welcomed his message were baptized. And they're talking about the, the message of Peter. And that day about 3,000 persons were added to the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread, which we will do later this morning, and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. And that's, that's where we're going to end the reading, right there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of Pentecost is really a story about the power of God. Oftentimes we refer to Pentecost as the birthday of the church. And that really is not an inaccurate description of this day, but it is an inadequate description of this day. The best way I think to think about it is that it is the story about the power of God, how the power of God came to live in the lives of the disciples. This is a story about how the power of God could come to live in your life and mine. As is always the case, I think it's important and interesting to understand the context of this particular story. We find it in the first chapter of Acts. If you were here two weeks ago, I preached on this story in the first half, uh, first half of the ch first chapter of Acts. Last week, Denise preached the second half of the first chapter of Acts, which was about the ascension of Jesus. But in the very opening uh, verses of Acts, first chapter, Luke tells us, about Jesus gathering the disciples around him. This is the resurrected Jesus. 
And he's been alive, he's been resurrected for 40 days. And he tells the disciples to do something which is truly unusual. Because as I said at the time, whenever you read about in the New Testament about Jesus, he's always saying, go and do this. Old Testament, New Testament, both. Go and take care of the poor. Go feed my sheep. Uh, uh, Go visit people who are in jail. Make sure that the hungry are fed. But in this particular moment, in the opening part of Acts, Jesus tells the disciples to do nothing. To do nothing. He says, I want you to stay here in Jerusalem and wait and do nothing until the power of God has come upon you. It is a a strange and extraordinarily important commandment by Jesus. And after he told them that, Jesus ascended into heaven. And so then we find the disciples doing nothing but waiting. I say we find them doing nothing but waiting. The truth of the matter is that we have to kind of use our imagination here and speculate about what took place. Because after Acts 1 ends with the ascension of Jesus, we know that 40 days took place before Pentecost Sunday. But we don't know anything about those 40 days. We turn the chapter, we turn the page, there's chapter 2, it tells us about Pentecost that we just read. And so we have to speculate, what was it like for the disciples sitting around Jerusalem, waiting, doing nothing, until the power of God descended upon them? Well, this is nothing but my imagination gone wild. It is speculation. But for instance, I think about Peter with whom I identify so much. This had to have been tremendously difficult for Peter. You know the story of Peter. Peter was the person who considered him to be a leader amongst men. Peter was always getting out in front of God. There is that story where Jesus comes out to the boat on the Sea of Galilee walking on the water and Peter says, I can do that, I can do that. And he did it for a few seconds and then he started drowning. And then there was that story in the middle of Matthew where Caesarea, where Jesus says to the disciples, who do people say I am? And they all start guessing. And and Peter rather brilliantly says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. God has revealed this to you. But in the next moment, Peter denies that Jesus will ever have to suffer and die on the cross. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan. Peter was overly enthusiastic. He was always getting in front of God. There was that moment towards the end when Jesus, when Peter promised Jesus, I will never, ever leave you. I will never, ever deny you. And Jesus says, before the cock crows three times, you will. And sure enough, Peter denied him three times that night around the campfire. That was just Peter's personality. He wasn't a person who was inclined to sit around and do nothing. So can you imagine what it was like? They, maybe they spend the first day praying, and then that night they're having dinner, and, and Peter's going crazy. He says, listen, you guys, this is stupid. Why are we sitting around doing nothing? We know what we're supposed to be doing. You remember the story at the end of John? He says, Jesus told me exactly what we should be doing. Jesus came to me directly and said, Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. Peter, if you love me, feed my lambs. Peter, if you care about me, care for my people, we ought to be out there doing something. And my guess is that some wise disciple, maybe John, pulled Peter aside. He said, Peter, just chill, if you don't mind. I don't think he really used that word, but... I wanted to use a word you would get. (laughs) He said, just chill. Listen, I know that Jesus told us to feed his sheep, but the last thing he said was to wait here in Jerusalem until the power of God has come upon us. So maybe it's time to understand that being faithful means doing nothing and waiting until it is God's time. Waiting until it is God's time. I don't know about you, 
But some of the biggest mistakes I've made in my life have involved me getting out in front of God. That's what we do as human beings, isn't it? We get scared, we panic, we get confused, or maybe we're just simply overly enthusiastic. And so we're like Peter. We are unable to sit still and wait for God's time. In the New Testament, there are two words that are used, that are translated as time. This is really interesting. These are Greek words. I don't know any Greek. Denise can read the New Testament somewhat in Greek. I can't, but I know these two words in Greek. So when you are reading your New Testament and you see the word time, it's one of two Greek words. I'll show them to you up here on the screen. One is chronos. The Greeks were really smart because of this. Chronos, chronos is the way you and I generally speak about time. I love watches. I've loved watches all my life. I like to have a really accurate watch. Chronos is the way you, I, you and I keep track of time with our watches or with our calendars, with our clocks. And so we have words like chronological or maybe you own a chronograph as a watch. But they had another word for time. It was the word kairos. And when the Greeks used the word kairos, they were talking about the most um, favorable time. They were talking about the opportune time. But when we read the word kairos in the New Testament, we translate it in this way. It is God's time. It is God's time. And that's what's taking place here between chapter 1 and chapter 2. It is the disciples waiting for God's time. Maybe the best illustration of Kairos is childbirth. You know how it works. The mother and the daddy come together and the seed is planted and at some point the mommy goes to the doctor and the doctor says, ooh, there's life inside of you. And so the process of waiting begins. And the obstetrician will probably say something like, okay, there's this many days, about nine months, that's when we'll expect this child to be born. And you'll probably go back home and you'll mark your calendar. Maybe you're the grandparent or the uncle or something. You'll mark your calendar. Oh, this is when this child is expected. And along the way, mommy will go to the doctor on occasion and they'll do one of those sonograms. And I said, well, you can see the baby growing. But listen, nobody can tell you exactly when that child is going to be born. The obstetrician can't tell you. The radiologist that does the sonogram can't tell you. The obstetric nurse can't tell you. I mentioned, this just came to me uh, at the last service. I was a twin. I have a twin brother. And I didn't even tell him this part. I was, um, both of us, we were full term. Uh, babies, both of us weighed over seven pounds. We held the record for decades at Methodist Hospital in Dallas. And uh, when my mother got to that ninth month, she was ready. <laughs> she was ready. And I remember them telling stories because this is what they thought back in the old days, 1948. It's the old days for some of you at least. Uh, they, they thought, you know, um, somebody told my father to take my mother on a ride on a bumpy country road and that would get things started. Some of you remember this, right? But it didn't work. It's because the birth of a child, that's Kairos. That's God's time. Only God knows. So I'm going to finish up. Here's what I want to say to you. I've come to believe that the most difficult and painful time for most of us in our lives is that time which lies between chapter 1 and chapter 2. Jesus has ascended and is nowhere to be seen. And the power of God has not yet descended. And so maybe you're left struggling with a bout of depression and you're thinking, dear God, when is this going to end? 
or you're waiting for the chemo to become effective or you're waiting and praying and striving to get this child through this difficult period of her life. And I could go on and on and on, but I don't have to because you've got your own very personal stories about what it means to live between chapter 1 and chapter 2, a time when Jesus can no longer be seen, but the power of God is not yet descended. This is what it means to live faithfully. It is to trust the remarkable good news that God has been there and that God's power will be there in your life again. It is to believe and understand that we are powerless without God, but with God, all things are possible. Between chapter one and chapter two, we are all Pentecostals waiting faithfully for the power of God in our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.